Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday afternoon, uh, 3.45 in the afternoon. I'm going to see how far we can get with this before Catherine starts crying. Uh, we might have to make it the whole way, I don't know. But today we're going to be talking about Fugitive Slave Acts, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and uh, the Republican Party. And let's go ahead and get our PowerPoint up. Any second now. There we go. And I'm gonna start with a couple of quotes. This is God's curse on slavery, a bitter, bitter, most accursed thing, a curse to the master and a curse to the slave. I was a fool to think I could make anything good out of such a deadly evil. Witness, eternal God, a witness that from this hour, I will do what one man can to drive out this curse of slavery from my land. These are passages from Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cat which I'm sure that most of you are familiar with. Uh, an immediate phenomenon, it sold 300,000 copies in its first year. Uh, unbelievable number today, uh, imagine in 1850s. Uh, so it was uh, already a pretty prominent person. Uh, she was a sister of one of the most famous preachers in America, Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, and she called the Fugitive Slave Law, which we'll be discussing later, an abomination. And in 1851 to 52, she published a series of articles in abolitionist newspapers. Uh, within seven years, Uncle Tom's Cabin had sold one million copies. Um, and this is when there's approximately 25 million people living in this country. Uh, the book is debatably, but possibly the most important novel ever published in US history in terms of its impact. Uh, it showed the brutality of slavery in a way that other writings had not. Uh, at the end, Uncle Tom was brutally beaten and killed at the end of the novel. Uh, it made many just regular run-of-the-mill northerners, not just radical abolitionists, think about slavery in ways that they had not done prior. Uh, many regular people had come to terms with the brutality of slavery uh, in ways that they hadn't before. They began to think about it, I'm sorry. Uh, and when Abraham Lincoln invited Stowe to the White House in 1862, he allegedly said, quote, uh, so this is the little lady who wrote the book that made this great war. Uh, not surprisingly, the South reacted very angrily toward the novel. It was, uh, just barely veiled assault on the institution of slavery, uh, their way of life of slaveholders. And again, this momentum that we've been speaking about, this building and building, the, this regional, this sectionalism, pitting one another against uh, antagonism uh, is growing. Um, so why had Stowe written this book in the first place? Well, we talked with you, when is a couple weeks back, we spoke about the new land in the West. Uh, Northerners are asking Congress to ban slavery outside of where it had already existed. Southerners arguing that Congress had no right to ban slavery. Uh, California statehood, a free state, uh, forced this issue, and even moderate Southern politicians are threatening with secession. So comes along Henry Clay, and a lot of other backroom wheeling and dealing is happening. Um, one of the things I don't believe, I do not believe I mentioned earlier was how central this trio here, these three men were passed, were, uh, they were essential to passing the compromise. Uh, these men, politically very different, uh, different states and regions uh, that spent their, most of their careers together. Uh, they were professional politicians. They relished deal making, uh, especially the kind of behind closed doors with cigars and bourbons and arguing and then handshakes. Um, let's review the compromise real quickly. First, as you see, California is a free, straight, free state. Second, 
Uh, all other lands acquired after the Mexican War, uh, they will not have a restriction to slavery. It will be decided upon by the people. They will vote. Third, uh, the slave trade, but not slavery itself, was banned in Washington, D.C. And then finally, uh, a new, more effective, stringent fugitive slave law be passed. Uh, compromise might not be the right word uh, for this settlement in 1850, more like armistice. Um, Well, here, I want to show you that here. That's the, the compromise. We might remember this map from before. Uh, people were quite happy at first. Uh, there were celebrations for saving the Union and cities across the country. Business interests in the North and the South rejoiced. Uh, but the fragility of the compromise was immediately clear. Uh, the Georgia state legislature met in December of 1850 and passed what they called the Georgia Platform, sent it to politicians and newspapers across the Deep South. Um, so what's the Georgia Platform? It said that the state of Georgia gave only its conditional acceptance to the compromise measures, uh, waiting to see whether the North acted in good faith. Uh, and so in other words, we don't necessarily trust you to do what you say you're going to do. Uh, some Northern state legislators said, Okay, well, they passed resolutions saying, well, we don't trust you either, uh, rather petty, perhaps, um, but fugitive slaves. In the North, many people reacted particularly bitterly to the fugitive slave law. Uh, that was part of the compromise, of, that was part of the compromise of 1850. On uh, circles of people, uh, certain circles that tended to be uncomfortable with slavery, uh, and of course, this is not certain, certainly not everyone in the northern part, but the opposition to the fugitive state law, state slave law quickly uh, became intense. Back to Uncle Tom's Cabin, the most influential reaction to this law uh, came from this novel. Um, at the time, it was so ripe uh, for this incendiary text, as one critic described, quote, on both sides of the sectional divide, the, t divide, the timber was dry and stove struck the igniting spark. It's pretty strong. Uh, and that shouldn't be a surprise, given the passages I read earlier. Uh, this novel seemed designed to enrage Southerners. Uh, slavery supporters published nearly 30 anti-Tom novels in the years, decade following with titles such as Aunt Phyllis's Cabin, The Planter's Northern Bride, and The Sword of the, and the Distaff. Uh, a review in the Southern Press explained that the, uh, the authoress of this work, um, as well, uh, you know, this is a long quote, we're gonna skip it. They didn't like it. Um, we'll just say that much, right? Um, but at the end of the, this long quote, it said uh, they should, that Mrs. Stowe should, uh, if she's such a fan of the Bible, perhaps she should read it and go to the book of Exodus, where it says, thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Anyway, further indicating, this is where we get into the meat of this here, the fugitive slave cases that uh, are happening here that are, that are really getting a lot of people riled up both North and South, right? Um, indicating to Southerners that Yankees uh, would not honor the, the law uh, of God or of land uh, rights or a series of prominent fugitive slave cases uh, and rescues that were a very big deal. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Law created a new class of special federal magistrates whose job was just to deal with these slave cases. Uh, magistrates appointed uh, went all over the North to set up police apparatus to retrieve fugitive slaves and then to conduct courts uh, to determine their identity. This, of course, is prior to widespread photography. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act itself said that those magistrates would be paid twice as much money if they returned a person into bondage than they would if they kept that person uh, in freedom. So they actually were paid ten dollars for every fugitive slave they convicted uh, and only five dollars for every acquittal. So you can see where the motivation would have been. 
uh, and this also angered many people. Uh, this led to a series of dramatic fugitive slave rescues in the North, um, such as Jerry McHenry in Syracuse in 1851, uh, in a violent rescue by abolitionists, uh, killed one of his captors and carted McHenry off to Canada. Uh, it led to the famous rescue of Shadrach Minkins in early 1852 in Boston. He was a fugitive slave from Virginia working in an abolitionist coffee house in Boston. Uh, he was retrieved by slave captors, taken to jail. Uh, but he was broken out of that jail. Uh, one of the jailers was murdered by the mob abolitionists. Uh, and they led uh, him to uh, down the street uh, and they hold him up in this house uh, with a uh, keg of gunpowder in front of the door in which one abolitionist threatened to blow it up if the magistrates came near him. Uh, that night they spirited him off to Concord, Massachusetts uh, where the descendants of abolitionists like to argue what house he stayed in uh, at that time, but later he did make his way to Canada where he lived the rest of his life as uh, a grocer. And these are the kind of dramatic events that are happening all throughout the North. Um, Anthony Burns, though, is one that we're going to focus on now. Um, so only about a thousand of roughly three million enslaved people uh, in the United States escaped on any, in any given year. It's a small number, but symbolically it's very, it's very important because the slaveholding South believes that they have, that the U.S. government should help retrieve this property. Uh, many in the North believe passionately that the United States government should not do that. Uh, in all of the 1850s, about 332 enslaved people who had managed to run away from their enslaver were sent back. Um, this is not a large number, especially given that there was nearly four million enslaved people in this country by 1860. Again, the importance of the phenomenon is more symbolic. Anthony Burns is the most famous of the fugitive slave cases. Not the first or only, but most famous. Uh, he escaped from Virginia to Boston in 1854. He was taken into custody, uh, and his owner sought to have the United States government return home. Democratic President Pierce, Franklin Pierce, said that the government, quote, would incur any expense to enforce the law. Abolitionists, many other boss and others in Boston fought Bur Burns' return to Virginia, but in the end, at a cost of over $100,000 and the use of a Navy ship, Burns was removed from Boston and taken back to Virginia. Thousands of people in Boston mourned as Burns was taken away. They hung American flags upside down, draped buildings in all black. Many northern states passed what they called personal liberty laws, which sought to guarantee the liberty of individuals on the state level and override the federal laws. White southerners, of course, watched with anger and alarm as one element of the compromise of 1850 that they considered a victory seemed to become meaningless in the face of Northern States. Also happening is a weakening of sectional partisan alignments. People in the North and South watch one another in horror in the wake of the compromise. Uh, the alliances they had managed to keep it, these lines that they formed managed to keep the peace and two sections though began to fall apart quickly. By the 1850s, the line of white settlement had moved as far west as the Great Bend of the Missouri River near the present day border of Kansas. Uh, there stretched out an expansive plains that most, most white Americans believe to be useless. It was often referred to as the Great American Desert. However, it's becoming really relatively clear to people that this actually is good farmland. We can grow things out here. Um, so states in the old Northwest, uh, there's prospective settlers urging the government to open the area up to them. Of course, when it was considered not useful, it was given to Native Americans. Uh, there was little opposition from anyone about displacing Native Americans from the land that they had been promised. Uh, but the interest in white settlement, of course, brought the question of slavery back into the center of things. Things came to a head 
when an Illinois center, senator that you may have heard of, Stephen Douglas, nicknamed the Little Giant, he proposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. He was eager to see the organization of the remaining pieces of the Louisiana Territory, and he wanted to see the territories in the upper Midwest, Kansas and Nebraska, become, get ready for statehood as quickly as possible. And this had a lot to do with railroads. Douglas wanted railroads to go through Chicago. And for it to be able to do that, though, the U.S. would have to claim the lands in the West to make way for it. It also had a lot to do with Douglas's giant ego. He desperately wanted to be president. And he thought that if he were the guy to settle the slavery in the West issue once and for all, he would be the most influential, famous politician in America and be elected to the presidency. To win congressional support for his idea, Douglas needed to woo Southern members of Congress who were not likely to be in a hurry to add more free states to the Union, undermining their political power, of course. Douglas had this idea to get them on board, to get rid of the Missouri Compromise, do away with this, let the territories just decide for themselves whether there would be slavery or not. And of course, this is a big deal. And when it gets the basic principles, uh, working both the Missouri Compromise uh, and the Compromise of 1850, it opened up the possibility that places which never had slavery could have slavery. And Douglas wasn't really concerned about that. He didn't think necessarily that slaveholders would uh, be all that interested in moving to the prairie. He was relatively surprised to see this uproar come from his, what he thought was just a little scheme to get Kansas and Nebraska organized as territories. And what he hadn't realized that many people in the North are being held closely, held tightly, I'm sorry, to the Missouri Compromise. Which, which had banned slavery in both Kansas and Nebraska. And this is going to, this is going back on a promise. One Northern congressman said that it was, as you can see from this quote, a gross violation of a sacred pledge. I'll let you read the rest on your own time, but this is clearly not the language of compromise. But ignoring all the anger, that was happening, Douglas and other Democrats with the support of many Southerners pushed the bill through Congress. And for Northerners, this was just another example of a slave power conspiracy at work, pushing its own agenda against the will of the majority and against the interests of free white laborers. And in the wake of this Kansas-Nebraska Act, those alliances that held the two national political parties together finally broke. And we start to see an absolute first in American history. And this is why the Kansas Act and Nebraska Act is a big deal. It marked the first time that the political parties began to form that were exclusively dedicated to the interests of either the North or the South. There we go. Kansas Nebraska Act killed the Whig Party. Southern Whigs generally found a home in the Democratic Party. And there was a question as to what was going to happen among the Whigs of the North, though. Now, initially, there was the American or the Know Nothing Party. It seemed like that was going to be the group that would take on the dying Whigs. And this party, the Know Nothings, attracted voters who were distressed by the flood of new immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants from Ireland, Southern Germany, recall the film Gangs of New York. Uh, the party had some successes in 1852 and began to have real power on the national level in the following elections, 54 and 5 after Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, no Nothings made a strong showing in Pennsylvania, New York, uh, even won control of the state government of Massachusetts. Uh, former Vice President and President uh, Millard Fillmore became a prominent No Nothing. But this party is based on exclusion. Their numbers are tight. They're not welcoming to all these new immigrants that are coming in. They don't have much of a chance of growing all that much. Uh, the future did not belong to the Whig Party. It belonged to the Republicans. The Republican Party was formed almost overnight in response to Kansas, Nebraska. 
first called the anti-Kansas party. There were three or four towns all over the Midwest that claimed to be the spot where the Republican party um, had their first meetings, places in Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, but the, really, the party was really born in a ser through a series of meetings all across the North to discuss this act, to react to it, and to figure out how to politically resist it. So to many Northerners now who believed uh, for whom the American dream was mobility in the West, availability of cheap, if not free land in the West, the possibility of a small firm, form, farmer, small mechanic, moving West, giving land into society without slaves, now seem to be completely thrown up in the air, if not denied. Hold on. Do we just hear the baby? I don't think so. But let's check. Have this little thing here. Oh no. Let's see here. And you can. Oh, wait. She's not crying. I'm not going to bother her. Anyway, let's continue. Um, there is widespread belief amongst Northerners at this time who flocked to this new party. Um, that there was this so-called slave power conspiracy, a concerted effort by slaveholders to gain more and more political power and crush the free North. Uh, fear that there was fear that if slaves were allowed to the West, that ultimately they would be in the North. That slavery would be reintroduced into the Northern free states. I mean, it could seem a bit far-fetched, but then let's see an article in the New York Post predicted, quote, Gangs of men and women chained together may be seen now marching up or down Broadway or trembling in Battery Park. Uh, so what happened that summer, uh, and especially in the fall of 1854, was one of the most, was the most rapid third party coalition movement in American history. Party was brand new, not even six months old at this point when it elected 100 people to the House of Representatives. Uh, and by the fall elections of 54, it was, they were really putting together a remarkably large and powerful coalition. Uh, the old Free Soilers were still kind of around. They came around in 1848, and in the 52 elections, they had a few people elected to Congress, I believe four. Um, but more importantly, that the Republican Party now had tremendous crossover appeal to Northern Democrats. Lifelong Democrats are breaking Douglas, uh, popular sovereignty, breaking with their just political history to join this new free soil anti-slavery part party. One person who joined was David Wilmot from the, of the Wilmot Provisio. You will remember him. Uh, in 1854, he became a Republican. This is pretty early in the party's existence. Uh, this new coalition, as fledgling as it was maybe, a lot of strange uh, bedfellows here, people who had just fought with each other in Congress just a couple years prior are now forming this new party. Um, there's a few notions, key, key ideas here. Uh, one, the notion that the idea of the slave power that has, there is this idea that there is a slave power that must be resisted right now, politically. Two, they're rooting their political future and ideology in what they're calling an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. Slavery can exist where it exists, but federal government has power, has the power to restrict its spread. There's a slogan, make freedom national, slavery sectional. Third notion, free labor. This ideology that we have spoken about. Uh, the formation of the Republican Party shook the American political system to its core. It was the one of the first, it was the first time that a major political party had it was formed, dedicated to the interests of one particular region of the country. Um, it was a political party dedicated entirely to stopping the spread of slavery. Now, I'm not saying the spread. This is not an abolitionist party by any means. They are. They do not want to affect. They just want to affect where it. Keep it where it was. Keep it contained. Make freedom national. Slavery sectional. Republicans had a remarkably quick rise. 
a Iran presidential candidate in 1856. Uh, this election shows the extent which American politics are being reorganized among sectional lines. Uh, Republicans ran this Western hero, John C. Fremont, an army officer and explorer. They rallied enthusiastically for uh, the purpose of stopping the spread of slavery. Um, and this was a, a crusading zeal amongst them. Democrats view these Republicans as insane, as evil. Uh, Pro-slavery Democrats, especially now, uh, those especially saw enorm they saw enormous threat to Southern institutes uh, in spite of any rhetoric. You know, they don't trust, we're saying we don't trust you. One, one person called them, the Republicans, a party of stinking Negro stealing abolitionists. Republicans, again, this was not an abolition party. There was a perception. The Democrats knew a Southern candidate could not win. They need a doe face. A doe face is a Northerner who is pliable to Southern interests. They found James Buchanan, a lifelong Democrat, and another one of these guys who just always wanted to be the president. Uh, Buchanan was overshadowed throughout much of his political career by Douglas, but Douglas is now damaged goods because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, Buchanan won the election, carrying every slave state and a few northern states. Uh, Fremont took the remainder of the free states. Uh, he had nearly 1.3 million votes compared to the 1.8 votes that Buchanan got. Uh, however, it became very clear after this election the Republican Party was going to be forced to be reckoned with. This was serious. They're not going away. It's not the know-nothings or the free soilers. Um, this will be the first time also that the vote was completely sectional. Old party systems that had united the North and the South were no more. Kansas, Nebraska sought to finesse the questions of extending slavery into the territories by allowing residents to decide if there would be slavery or not. Douglas had pushed for this doctrine of popular sovereignty uh, to calm things, uh, to push slavery into the territories, um, like to make it not a part of the national, national spotlight, but it had the opposite effect. Uh, it made this the central question of the moment, and it made everybody just about Man and Stephen Douglas. I uh, fired up both pro and anti slavery extensions around Kansas and it fired them up in a very large way. Uh, it is in both the North and the South, uh, groups organized to get people out to Kansas as quickly as possible, fill it with people. Uh, both sides saw this as a battleground for determining whether or not slavery would expand in the country or grow isolated and wither away and die. So we'll stop here. We'll continue with more about Kansas next time. And email me if you have any questions. Oh, we have company. Start. Is that a baby? OK, baby's up. Got to go now. Is that a fun ending to your lecture?